Axlotl tanks are fundamentally linked to the creation of Golas in the Dune series, and again is an important technology throughout, remaining a focal point for one of the more interesting mysteries in the novels, why there are apparently no Tleilaxu females. The technologies involved also continue to evolve throughout the Dune series, and are products of both the Butlerian Jihad, and later the prescriptions of Leto II. The first Gola in the Dune series is the character of Piter de Vries, the Baron Harkonnen's twisted mentat. However, the first proper use of a Gola is by the conspiracy against Paul in Dune Messiah, with the Hate Gola, the first reincarnation of Duncan Idaho. The Guild has decided to present Paul with the gift of Hate, whom they hope to use against the Emperor in a manner that is only revealed by the true machinations of the Tleilaxu plot. This is part of an altogether different agenda from the rest of their co-conspirators. Having the Guild present the Gola rather than their own ambassadors is part of their plot, and intended to divert blame when the Gola's true purpose is revealed. The Gola technology is essentially a clone created from a dead individual's cells, which retains no memories of the dead person from whose DNA it has been created. Golas do not emerge as fully grown adults, and are trained during the process of their creation in any number of ways. However, the first Duncan Idaho Gola, Hate, must have been developed using some kind of accelerated growth, considering the time passed from the moment of his death to his arrival in the court of Moadib. Duncan Idaho was one of Paul's father's most trusted men, and trained as a swordmaster from the schools on Ginaz another one of the physical mental training schools created in the aftermath of the Butlerian Jihad. Idaho was killed fighting off Shaddam IV's Sardaukar on Arrakis, and due to the fact that he was able to kill so many of the Emperor's crack troops single-handed, a Sardaukar officer took his body and sold it to the Tleilaxu, recognising perhaps its genetic worth. The Tleilaxu were then able to create their first Idaho Gola in one of their Axlotl tanks, and in this case, they trained Hate, as he became known, in Zen Sunni philosophy and as a mentat. The first Idaho Gola has none of his original memories from his actual life, and this is common for Golas at this point in the Dune timeline. He also differs from later Golas by having metal Tleilaxu eyes. The Hate Gola is sold to the Guild, who then in turn offers him as a gift to Paul when he is Emperor. The purpose of the Idaho Gola from the Tleilaxu point of view is to continually weaken Paul's strength of mind and to act as almost a psychic poison, to whittle away at Paul's resolve. The conspirators, using Paul's wife Irulan, have been slowly poisoning his concubine Chani with a contraceptive toxin in order to prevent her from giving birth to an heir. The members of the conspiracy seek to control Paul and whatever dynasty he creates through his bloodline, but their attempts ultimately fail. Chani realises that she has been poisoned and returns to the old ways of the Fremen, living on a traditional diet. She ultimately conceives, but the diet, heavily laced with melange and in combination with the poisons she has taken, accelerate her pregnancy in a dangerous fashion which is ultimately fatal to her. However, at the critical moment, the Tleilaxu set the true purpose of their plan in motion, once again showing Herbert's love for complexity and the recurring plans within plans within plans motif that is much a part of the Byzantine intrigues of the Dune series. At the end of Dune Messiah, Chani gives birth to twins, Leto II and Ganema, but dies shortly afterwards as a result of the poison she has ingested. Paul, who is physically blind at this point, though still has his prescient vision, is overcome with grief. He is confronted by Skytail, who has through the dwarf Bijaz passed on the commands to Duncan Idaho that had been hypnotically imprinted during his creation in the Axlotl tanks. The mental trauma of being put in a position of killing his former master creates a situation where Duncan Idaho's true personality returns leaving Hate behind, and once again serving Paul as his loyal swordmaster. Skytail's offer to Paul, given precisely at the time when he is grief-stricken, is to create a gola of his dead concubine, Chani. 
the Skytail threatens killing the newborn children, and Paul, who is blind, is lent the prescient sight of the baby Leto II, who is born fully aware and is able to finally kill the face dancer. This, however, was not the full extent of the plan, and when Bijaz arrives, the dwarf reveals that the true intent was to determine whether or not a Gola could have its original personality and memories fully restored. Hate as a mere physical copy of the former Atreides swordsmaster would not have been enough to entice Paul in his grief to agree to such a bargain, but a fully restored Duncan Idaho is the bait of the real trap, showing Paul right in front of him true proof that he can have his dead love restored to him. Fearing he may succumb, he asks Duncan to kill Bijaz before his grief overwhelms him and he can resist their offer no longer. The Hate Gola is the first of many such reincarnations of Duncan Idaho, this one dying at the hand of Stilgard to provoke him into action against Alia during the events in Children of Dune. However, the Duncan Idaho Golas are continually reincarnated by the Tleilaxu at the behest of Leto II, who uses Duncan as a boon companion, commander of his armies and occasional stud for his breeding programme. Each time a Gola is created, its memories must be restored by a traumatic process akin to the one which Hate went through. As such, this strongly echoes George Bernard Shaw's summation of Samuel Butler's ideas of the latency of memory and its re emergence through associated ideas of the collective unconscious. By the time of the events in God Emperor of Dune, there have been numerous incarnations of the Duncan Idaho Golas. And although the true number is not clear, after the death of the present Duncan Idaho in an assassination attempt on the God Emperor, Leto II reveals that 19 Duncans died what people usually refer to as natural deaths. It is the qualities of Duncan Idaho that the Atreides have always loved in him that causes the God Emperor to have one constantly at his side. Duncan was a handsome man, a highly skilled soldier and fanatically loyal to the Atreides, but it is one particular trait that Leto II is interested in, and that is his rebellious streak. Each time a new Duncan Idaho is delivered to the God Emperor by the Bene Tleilax, a period of transition and acclimatisation is required, as each of these Golas has only memories of their life and death some three and a half thousand years ago. At this point the memories of the Golas are not cumulative, and they are often disturbed by the degree of change and amount of time that has passed since they were last alive. They also have to adjust to the God Emperor himself, who resembles a giant worm more than he does a man. Leto II often speaks to the Idaho Golas initially as either his father Paul or his grandfather Leto I, to provide some sense of familiarity to the Atreides. It is ultimately Duncan's loyalty to the Atreides family that the God Emperor relies upon to bring each Gola into his service. It is the God Emperor's intent to breed Duncan with Siona, the daughter of Maneo, his major domo, and an Atreides Skyon. Siona is essentially the end result of Leto II's breeding program and has been bred to have a genetic trait that allows her to remain hidden from those with prescient abilities. All of Siona and Duncan's descendants will also have this ability, providing a genetic form of protection that is necessary for the survival of humanity and a part of Leto II's golden path. In the final two books of Herbert's Dune series, the focus shifts to the Bene Gesserit, and it is they who have taken over the remnants of Leto II's breeding program, in addition to continuing to procure Duncan Idaho Golas from the Bene Tleilax. The Duncan Idaho of this period has been altered to some hidden purpose by the Tleilaxu within their axolotl tanks. This hidden ability is to be able to resist the sexual imprinting techniques used by the Bene Gesserit and their dark counterparts who have returned from the scattering, the Honoured Matres. During an attempt at sexual imprinting by an Honoured Matre called Mirbella, Duncan is able to turn this back upon her the result being to sexually imprint her to him. This imprinting is essentially a form of sexual enslavement and dependency on the imprinter by the imprinted, and as such is the main tool used by the formidable Honoured Matres to enslave the male population. 
The additional side effect of the attempt at sexually imprinting Duncan Idaho is to release the cumulative store of memories from all his previous incarnations, as Golas throughout the millennia, essentially another form of other memory akin to that of the male-focused Kwisatz Hadaraks and the female-focused Bene Gesserit. The essential difference is that Duncan Idaho's memories are personal, rather than being a true, collective unconscious-like, other memory. As revealed in the completion of the Dune series by Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson, Duncan Idaho is revealed to be the ultimate Kwisatz Satarak, and I shall touch upon this later in this chapter. The technology which creates him however is the Talaraxu Axlotl tanks, and these machines also develop one final evolutionary change. In Heretics of Dune, Axlotl tanks are described as being a Tleilaxu device for reproducing a living human being from the cells of a cadaver. But due to the stranglehold on the universe's most desired and essential commodity, the Bene Tleilax have long been working on a means to produce artificial melange. With this shift of use in their secret technology, for every milligram of melange produced on Rakus, the Bene Tleilax tanks produced long tons providing the Tleilaxu with a powerful economic and political advantage over the other prominent power groups. With real melange on Rakis being quite the scarce commodity, as it had been since the times of Leto II, it is now the Tleilaxu who, albeit briefly, are able to exercise what Herbert called hydraulic despotism, especially over the Guild and the Bene Gesserit Sisterhood. The creation of the Duncan Idaho Golas for the Bene Gesserit comes at a high price too, with the Tleilaxu forcing them to pay each time in large quantities of melange, even when they as a people now have no real need for it. The Bene Gesserit's Bashar, Miles Teg, is easily able to deduce the reasoning behind this. And the Tleilaxu. They have decanted Duncan Idaho Golas from their axolotl tanks for millennia, even after the death of the tyrant. The Tleilaxu had sold this Gola to the Sisterhood twelve times, and the Sisterhood had paid in the hardest currency, melange from their own precious stores. Why did the Tleilaxu accept in payment something they produced so copiously? Obvious. To deplete the Sisterhood's supplies, a special form of greed there, the Tleilaxu were buying supremacy. A par game. With the eventual destruction of Rakis and the last surviving worm on board the no-ship which holds Duncan Idaho, Murbella, and Skytail, it is through the last known surviving member of the Tleilaxu that the secret to the creation of Melange remains, hidden in the null entropy tube buried in his chest. The Tleilaxu's technological tools are totally based around the science of genetics, whereas the Ixians are more focused on mechanical technologies which often come close to violating the tenets of the Great Convention and the lessons learned from the Butlerian Jihad. Both sets of technologies are what we could consider mimetic, in that their ideas and concepts evolve in a similar way to biological evolution, and in the case of the Tleilaxu, have completely altered the genetic makeup of a people creating a different and almost alien species of human being that has to a certain extent a religious genetic case system imposed upon their own society. The Ixian technologies evolve as a response to the results of the Kwisatz Haderach breeding program, which in turn see the God Emperor complete his own breeding program in Siona, creating a human who can hide from prescience in the same way as an Ixian no-ship. Towards the end of events of Chapter House Dune, the Ixian civilization is in decline. The Bene Gesserit Mother Superior Odrad, sensing that no matter the outcome of our contest, Ix is dying. Witness. No great Ixian innovations in centuries. The Ixian culture is technologically speaking the one social element of the Dune universe that flourishes under the rule of the God Emperor. Although Leto II, in his role as the ultimate predator, continues to impose the prescriptions on technology upon the general population, and most specifically those focused on machine intelligence, this is done to help mankind in their struggle to survive as part of the Golden Path. At the heart of the Golden Path is natural selection imposed by political force 
and guided perfectly by the god emperor's prescience, which is virtually inescapable. While most of the human societies of the Imperium suffer under his rule to a greater or lesser degree, the Ixians enjoy a relatively safe time, as they are the sole supplier of the technological needs of the god emperor. These technological innovations are necessary for the greater part to implement the lessons of the golden path that Leto II has foreseen after his four deaths, and to facilitate the passing on of the god emperor's ideas to the generations that come after his rule. As a result, it is the god emperor himself who spurs the innovations of the Ixians that are so fundamental to their growth as a technological society, and their decline is seemingly inevitable in the period during and after the scattering, as they have not suffered greatly under the yoke of the god emperor's tyrannical rule. As a result their innovations and ability to adapt stagnate, unlike the other human societies that have suffered greatly at the hands of the god emperor, yet have emerged after his three and a half thousand year rule, stronger than before. The Bene Tleilax have all but been destroyed by the honoured Matres, their own hubris coming from such a degree of dependency on a technology that has ultimately failed them, and brought their race to a point where individuals maintain a degree of immortality through the Gola process, but ultimately would seem to have a very limited gene pool to draw upon. It is the threat of their face dancers and their ability to embed a genetic weapon in individuals such as Duncan Idaho that ultimately caused the Honoured Matres to destroy their planet in a genocidal rage. In a universe where mankind has accelerated its own evolution based upon the spur that was the Butlerian Jihad, Herbert is clearly making a statement on the dangers of dependency upon technology, especially when linked to evolution. The crutch that was removed by the Butlerian Jihad has been taken up by both these races despite the prescriptions and dangers of technology apparent from the historical lessons learned by it. Taking the analogy further, by taking up this metaphorical crutch once again, both the Tleilaxu and the Ixians, in an attempt to run before they can walk, have ultimately crippled their development to the point of extinction in a universe where everyone else has been learning to slowly walk again. 